The sermon text today will come from the Gospel of Matthew in the 22nd chapter. Um, and we'll begin at the first verse. If you're looking in your pew Bibles, that's page 1534 where we will start. Uh, let's begin in the, about the first three verses of Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a kingdom, uh, is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent out his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. In the ancient world, when there was a custom when you're throwing a banquet to send out invitations, much as Matthew was describing, and you'd send it out in two phases. First, you'd send out the primary invitation and you would expect a response back from that, a confirmation that you were going to that banquet. And then the second one would be sort of a day of reminder. We'll read about that in just a minute, how he sends his servants out a second time. That's sort of the day of the banquet. You send them out to remind all your invited guests. But this first invitation goes out and Everybody refuses the king to come to this wedding banquet. Uh, and, 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 and why would anyone refuse this? Well, the wedding of a, of a prince, which is what this is, the king says, I'm throwing a wedding banquet for my, my son, who would be the prince. It was not only a party, not only a, a festival, it was also a political event. As you can imagine, royalty having a big event like this, it was a political occasion as well. And so for all of these invited guests, to simultaneously reject the invitation, we hear undertones of rebellion, don't we? We hear a coup stirring when everyone rejects the king's invitation to come to this. And indeed it is, a, 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 Jesus tells this parable to remind us of the rebellion that we as humans have had against God. As a parable though, he's speaking in his own context, particularly to the Jewish people. Who are the ones that are pictured here as the invited guest? The ones who are supposed to know that, that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. All of the law tells about Jesus who's coming. And all of the prophets prophesied that Jesus was coming. These Jewish people had these books. They had the law. They had the prophets. They had all the pieces. And Jesus checked all the boxes. They should have known that Jesus was the awaited Messiah. And yet, when he comes and stands before their faces, they reject him. In fact, in John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking with one of the teachers of the Jewish nation, Nicodemus. And Jesus begins to tell him that you have to be born again. You have to be born from above. And Nicodemus questions him, how can that happen? And you know what Jesus' response is? He says, how can you, a teacher of Israel, not understand these things? You have all of, the, all of the text that you need, all of the studying you've done your whole life. They all point to me. And yet, the Jews had such a hard time seeing this, they, they ultimately rejected Jesus. Though it's not just the Jews who are now pictured in this, because all of us, uh, at this point in time in our modern age, all of us have had an opportunity to hear the gospel. Um, and even if you haven't had an opportunity to hear the gospel, God makes himself known, and people, in general, reject him. They reject him. Paul writes this in Romans. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, speaking of God, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. This is all of us. When we reject God and rebel against him, we're without excuse. Human beings ultimately never decline to worship God because they lack an invitation to do so. They never, they never decline to worship God because they have a lack of an invitation to worship God. They decline to worship God because the sinful human heart wants to be God. That's why we reject him. We would rather be king than come and serve the king. Let's continue then in verses um, 4 to 6, or 4 to 5. But then he sent more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and they went off one to the field and another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. And the king was enraged. He sent his army and he destroyed those murderers and he burned their city. Why would someone want to miss a big wedding party? 
I, I love weddings. I don't know if you if you guys feel the same way, but I love going to weddings. Uh, I love the, the ceremony. It uh, reminds us so much about uh, what it means to be married, what it means to be in God. But then a- afterwards, the party. I mean, it's great, isn't it? Usually they have really good food at wedding receptions, barbecue and uh, such good stuff. Why would anyone want to miss that? Why would anyone turn that down? Well, I think in these verses, we begin to see some of the motivation as to why people would turn down the wedding reception. It says that one went to his farm and another went to his business. Essentially, they turned down the wedding reception because they wanted to. It's not that you couldn't take a, a little bit of time off of the farm or, or put the business aside for one day. You could, but they wanted to do their business and they wanted to farm instead of going to this wedding banquet. Makes me think. Why would someone want to miss a Sunday to worship God? Now, I understand, let me qualify that a little bit. I understand that there, there are some good and legitimate reasons. I'm thankful that uh, firefighters who need to work on Sunday work on Sunday and they, they take care of us. But uh, for the most part, why would someone uh, want to miss worship on Sunday? Maybe they say, well, you know, I have to work that day or... I've already got plans, or I've got sports, or it's too early in the morning, or I I just have a little bit of time off and that's where I want to spend it by myself. Essentially all of these answers boil down to this, because I wanted to. I missed Sunday because I wanted to miss Sunday. You could rearrange your plans. It's like when you ask the girl that's way out of your league on a date when you're a young man, you say, oh man, I build up the courage and you go ask her and say, hey, um, I'd love to take you on a date. Will you go with me? And she says, oh, I've got to wash my hair that night. (laughs) She doesn't have to wash her hair that night. She doesn't want to go on the date with you, right? Why do we not choose to worship God? What it really boils down to is we don't want to. Every other excuse is just a a, a thing, a flag, when the real answer is we don't want to go to that feast. We don't want to worship God. I prefer other things. The reason I miss Sundays is because I want to. Now, let's take that on a larger scale. It's not just Sunday. Let's take it on a larger scale. The reason that there will be some people who will not make it into heaven is because they preferred this world. The gospel is laid out in front of you. You say, repent, believe in Jesus Christ, pour your life out for him, and heaven is in store for you in Jesus Christ. And some people say, "Ah, that's too much. I don't want to pour myself out for Jesus. I don't want to lay my life down. I prefer to live my life in this world the way it is. That's what they want. That's what it really boils down to is what what do you want to do? In this case, he wanted to uh, live in the world. The things of this world are important, though. Let me, let me again qualify this and to say that, the, am I saying that farming or doing your business is wrong? No, it's not wrong. In fact, it's good. There are daily things that we need to do, and we need to do well in the Lord. If you're a farmer, farm well for the Lord. If you're a businessman, be honest and faithful and good in, at your business. But it's, there's nothing wrong with engaging in this world. But the problem is when we begin to prefer the world to the calling of God, then that those things become deadly, poisonous to us. And ultimately, will find us in destruction. Let's turn then to these next verses, verses 6 and 7. I read 6 before, I'll read it again here. The, the, the rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them, and the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. So again, in these verses, we see that the, the more clearly the gospel's presented, this is the second time the invitation went out. The first time they rejected it. The day of, he says, I've killed the calf. It's all prepared. Come. It's the day of the wedding. Come into the wedding. It's, it's right now. It's now or never. And what do they do? Not only do they reject the invitation, they see some of the people carrying the invitations and they kill them, they mistreat them, they beat them. And and what this teaches us as a parable is that the more clearly and urgently we present the gospel as Christians, the more hostile the world is going to become to us. And it's not like we're presenting some bad news. We're not like beating people up with anything. We're giving them the best news in the world. We're saying everyone who is hurting and trying to deal with their sin, we have good news as Christians. We have the best news. It is, it is a longing to be connected with God. With Some people might say it this way. You know, I just I want to connect with something bigger than myself. What they're really longing for is to connect with God. And the gospel is the answer to that. 
People become overwhelmed by trying to sift through an infinite number of religions and, philo and philosophies, and yet we have the gospel and can present it so clearly that if you will repent of your sin and cling to Jesus as God and Savior, then he will save you. And that's the only way that anyone will be saved. But when we become really clear with that message, that good news, the world around us is going to begin to become more and more hostile toward us. And it's not because the news is bad or we're, giving the, or we're doing anything wrong to someone. We're doing a great favor to spread this gospel. But it's that our sin nature as humans rejects God because our sin nature wants to be God. It works against our deepest desires to connect to God, doesn't it? Notice in these verses, in verse 7 in particular, what the penalty is for rejecting God. It's the destruction of their city. As a parable, what this points us to is perhaps the destruction of Jerusalem. When, when the Israelites rejected God, God caused the Babylonians to come in and destroy Jerusalem and take them off as captives. Maybe Jesus has this in mind, the destruction of their city. And it certainly could be that, but it's at least something else too. It's at least also the destruction of this world. That God is for a time inviting us, calling us. But eventually, if we end up rejecting God's invitation, there will come a point where the invitation is ended and God's wrath begins. That's the destruction of this world and it's coming. Again, it points us to the urgency of the gospel. We continue then in verses 8 to 10. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those invited did not deserve to come. Go into the street corners and invite to the banquet everyone, anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So this is, the, if this wedding banquet represents heaven, it represents salvation, it represents coming to be in the presence of God, what we see here uh, is that the expectation of salvation was initially given. The first invitation went out to the Jewish people. And they should have known, as we mentioned before. But what they should have known about salvation is that salvation was not in a religion, but in a person. Look at, all the way back to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. Uh, God speaks to Abraham, and the promise, the covenant promise that he gives to Abraham is that through you, Abraham, all families will be blessed. And then he, sa he speaks to Moses, and he says uh, through Moses that a prophet like you will arise in the nation of Israel. And then to David, he says, one of your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel. We traded, but the Jewish people, in, in particular, at that point in time, had traded the expectation of a personal savior, of a you, of a somebody, they had traded it for an impersonal religion. They were looking for the fulfillment of a religion instead of a person. And so they missed it. They rejected the savior Jesus when he came. But what happens to those, uh, what happens to to those who are supposed to come and they end up rejecting it. Well, what happens then is that God finds um, another way, which is really his way he intended all along, but we see it played out here. In verse 9 it says this, Go into the streets. My translation from my Bible at home says, Go therefore. Does it remind you of another sort of calling in the New Testament? Jesus of the Great Commission says, Go therefore into all the nations and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. Go into the main streets. What happens here is that the gospel invitation gets open not just to Jewish people, but now to the whole world. We're to invite the whole world to come into this banquet. Romans 11, Paul writes about Israel. And Paul says that salvation was indeed given to the Israelite people. The root of salvation and Israel grew out of that root. But what happens is God broke off Israel. This is Romans 11. God broke off Israel and grafted in the Gentiles. Grafted in a new root, a, a new branch into that root. And this is what Jesus, what Jesus is displaying for us here. That those who were invited didn't come to the, to the guest, to the party. And so those who are, 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 the invitation is sent out into the streets. Everyone come in. 
Now, before we move on, look at verse 10. It says that both evil and good people are brought into the banquet. This is important for all of us to understand that in heaven, in salvation, there are both supposedly good people and evil people. I'll put both of those in quotes because um, we, evil people always have some redeeming quality and good people are never quite as good as you think they are. It, it goes both ways, doesn't it? But we find both of them in heaven. We find both of them in heaven. So for those of you who, who think, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good person, but if you think you're a pretty good person and you're depending on that, be careful because the scriptures tell us if you've broken even one part of the law, you're guilty of all of it, all of it. So if you're depending on being a pretty good person to get into heaven, then when you die, you'll end up going straight to hell. It's not about being a good person. But on the other end of it, if you're thinking you're an evil person, you're thinking, man, I've done too much. I've gone too far in my life. There's no way that God will save me. There's good news in here, too, because there are evil people who will be brought in. Because the invitation is, is not for us to be a good person or not for us to stop being an evil person. The invitation is to trust in Jesus. Not to despair of our life, but not to trust in it either, but rather to trust in Jesus Christ. That's the invitation. Let's look at verses 11 and 14. 11 to 14. But when the king came in to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without the wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited but few are chosen. Now these are sort of jarring verses, aren't they? King invites everybody in, and all of a sudden he finds this one guy who's not wearing the right clothes and he kicks him out. What's that about? <laughs> Imagine if you came to church one day and we said, you're not wearing a tie, bind him hand and foot, throw him out into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is that what's going on here? No, I don't think so. This is a parable, remember, and part of the parable is to understand what's, uh, what's functioning, not just on the surface level of the story, but on the, the, uh, the significance and the, the level of meaning. What it means is that, that when we come into heaven, we are not to be wearing the, the, the robes, so to speak, of our own life. If we come, we'll be thrown out. We won't be counted righteous. Rather, we're to come wearing Christ, wearing his life wearing his righteousness. Listen to the way Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. And then Galatians 3.27, he writes, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We come into heaven because we're clothed in Christ, not because of anything we've done or not done. If we inwardly are clothed with Christ, then outwardly our lives will begin to reflect that. People will be able to see it just as clearly as this king was able to see that this man was not wearing a robe. People will be able to see that Christ is not really alive or clothing us in our life. It's a warning for those who would come into the church, but who would, who would take the name of Christ on their lips, but would do nothing to reflect Christ in their life. There will be some who you see in church who will be thrown into hell because in reality they have nothing to do with Christ. Now, am I saying that this is a works righteousness theology that you've got to do this life that looks a lot like Christ in order to be saved? No, I'm not. But what, in fact, you can't manufacture works. Some people try to do that to manufacture a, a, a life that looks like Christ, but if you're not clothed inwardly with Christ, it, it, it's all for naught. What we mean is, that God honors those who want to grow to be more and more like Christ. Who want it. Again, it's about motivation, isn't it? How do you want to forgive your enemy? You say, well, I, I can preach this from the pulpit. You better forgive your enemies. And you say, golly, all right, I'll do it, I guess. But that doesn't mean you want to, does it? How do you want to forgive your enemy? How do you want to sell your possessions and give money to the poor and go and follow Christ? How do you want to lose your life in order to find it? How do you want to wake up Sunday morning and come to church? 
Well, the only way that we can want to do that is if God changes our hearts. It's the only way. I can't do it. I can't preach an eloquent enough sermon to make you want that. But God can. Which helps us understand verse 14 a little better. Many are called, but few are chosen. The only way that the human heart is changed from rebellion to love is if God chooses to change that heart. It happens through the preaching of the gospel, but it's God's work in changing the human heart. This is one of those difficult doctrines that a lot of people wrestle with, predestination. Right? And, and I know that a lot of people reject predestination because it feels so counterintuitive to our free will. But I promise you it's thoroughly scriptural. Paul writes in Romans chapter 9, verse 16, So then, talking about salvation, So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who shows mercy. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the earth to be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the kind intention of his will. John 15, verse 16, Jesus himself says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you. God is sovereign. What we mean when we say that is that God is in charge, completely in charge of salvation, of the salvation of every single person. Everyone who is saved has been chosen by God for salvation, and no one whom God has chosen for salvation will ever be damned. It's God's sovereign choosing. You say, well, then what about man's free will? How do we reconcile man's free will if God's the one who chooses it? People will say, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How do you reconcile that, pastor? Well, I'm, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. One of my favorite responses to that comes from Charles Spurgeon, who de desiring to describe rightly the God's sovereign, uh, sovereignty and our free will described it as a doorway. And on this side of the doorway, we can only see what's on this side of the doorway. We can't see the other side until we walk through. But on this side of the doorway, we see above it, whosoever will. Whosoever will. And whoever wants to walk through that door can and will and should. But once we walk through that door and we step back to the other side to look at what the doorway says from the other perspective, it says, elect from the foundation of the earth. That we may choose to walk through that door, but it's not outside of God's sovereign choosing for us. So I can say, as a good Presbyterian minister and good Reformed theology, that today it is true of the Bible and it is true of the Gospel, that if you, if you will repent and believe in Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. That is undoubtedly a choice that you will have to make. But it will be God's working. But why talk about God's choosing at all if it's still a, if you believe, then you will be saved? Here's why. Here's why it's so important for us to understand God's sovereignty. Why God didn't hide this from us and instead just show us this side of the doorway. Because it becomes an incredible assurance of our salvation to understand that our, that our salvation belongs not to us but to God. So often in life, this world wrecks us with doubts and troubles and turmoils. And we begin to question ourselves and say, am I really saved? Do I really know Jesus? But when we know this doctrine of predestination, of God's sovereign choosing, we can lean on him and say, Lord, I don't know anything about myself, but I know you. And I know that you have chosen me for salvation. If you have ever earnestly and honestly desired salvation, trusted in Jesus Christ, repented of your sin, then brother and sister, you are saved. If that was real, then you are saved and you're not going to lose your salvation because God has chosen you from before the foundation of the world and he will not lose you. It's a doctrine of assurance. So today, the invitation goes out to you. Come. Come. Put your faith in Jesus. Come to the wedding feast. Enjoy the presence of our great God and King. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen.